the river steamer SS Nanana served communities along the Tanana and Yukon rivers for 20 years as part of the Alaska Railroad Steamboat Service. It was taken out of operation in 1954 and eventually moved to Fairbanks. There, it sat along the bank of the Chena River for eight years. In 1965, it was floated into what's now the Alaska Land Historic Park. The interior was gutted and turned into a restaurant and bar. In 1980, four large roofs were built in an attempt to shield the vessel from the weather, but the Nanana continued to decay. The Fairbanks Historical Preservation Foundation leased the vessel and began a complete restoration in 1987. We started in October of 1987. Uh, first thing we had to do was stabilize the bow, which was ready to fall apart, which we did. We stabilized it, uh, jacked and shored it back into its original configuration, and then stabilized it through the winter. We actually began restoration with the bow, the restructuring of the bow, in uh, 1988. As you can see, we've just lifted uh, a new timber onto the bed of the truck called a shelf. It runs, it's a, it's a major structural member uh, on the vessel in the bow. It runs from the stem aft at deck level. Uh, you can see the notches that have been cut into the shelf uh, to receive the deck beam. Uh, the old shelf is here, lying on the ground. And you can see how rotten it was. There you go. Bring it to me a little bit. Yeah, watch it go. Up this road. Now, once the shelf members are replaced, after these forward shelf members, we have two aft shelf members to replace. Then we will replace our deck beams and some structural members uh, from the Keelson up. We'll replace some of the timbers down below. Oh, that's in this one right here. We put it right beside them. We just put them all right beside them. Upside down. Well, we're cutting up some timbers uh, for the foredeck of the Ninana. Right now, we're in the process of cutting the finish decking. It all has to be special milled because the sizes are irregular in terms of today's dimensions at the lumber yard. They're kiln-dried, select structural fir timbers, which is precisely what was used on the Ninana when it was originally built. So they are perfect for our purposes. He's cutting them the long way here in order to get the vertical grain. It's necessary that we have a vertical grain on the finished decking because it wears much longer, and this is historically accurate. Uh, as you can see, this subdeck is now all laid. It is two by six. Uh, fur as was used in the original as is all of the material we're using is the same as the original material. We are going to deviate historically acceptable deviation in the laying of this rubber membrane. We're going to use this on top of the sub deck under the finish deck as a waterproofing. We're ready to lay this tomorrow afternoon. We'll start laying our finish deck which is three quarter by three and a half vertical grain uh, fur as was used once again in the original.
the steamer Nanana was built in 1932 and launched the following spring. I uh, was born in Nanana in 1924. So as a child, we used to go down and talk to the fellows and, and watch the building of the boat. Well, everybody in town uh, showed up for the launching and uh, all of a sudden it started moving and it just moved very slowly at first. Then all of a sudden it took off and it wound up in the river and it, with a great big splash. And of course, everybody was roaring and hollering and celebrating and the guys were patting each other on the back and, and hollering, we've done it, we've done it. <laughs> We had to pull all the shingles off in the first and pull all the staples out of the wood. Then we brought it down here and we laid it on the deck. But most of the material that we take off in here, we try and use over again. Each piece of plywood, we're going to pull it off and we're going to start taking the rafters off as we come back on this roof here. We had a total of four roofs on the boat we had to take off. They had to be taken off piece by piece. This way they put it up, we had to reverse the process and take it back apart because it was putting too much weight on the boat. We had to manhandle the whole roof and lower it down by ropes and that. We saved every piece of plywood, and we glued it to our three-quarter inch cedar, what they had for the decking. Well, they seem a little cumbersome, but it has to be done this way. What we're doing is we're overlaying the existing deck, which was uh, one by four red cedar, with this five-eighths exterior plywood. The final decking will be canvas laid in wet oil-based paint and linseed oil, the mixture being, what, uh, three to one, something like that. Um, and then when the paint dries as it dries, this shrinks the canvas tight to the fit, and the linseed oil removes all the moisture. And then on top of that, when that is all dry, we paint the canvas again on top. So you can see we're going to have a deck that will last for quite a while. Well, first of all, we got the deck saw ready to go and all epoxy and all the cracks sealed on them. And then we use Thompson water seal on it. As soon as we get a coat of paint on it, we lay a sheet of canvas on it. And let me pull this tight first, Jeff. Get me a couple nails. We nail it down, then we repaint it. Then after we get the full deck covered, then we're going to give it another coat of paint. Then we give it one more coat after that, and we let it set for two weeks. Then we give it the final coat with our color in it. The Nanana could carry up to 50 passengers in 24 staterooms. I made the trip on the uh, Ninana in 1948. I was a, about 20 then. And it was a 10-day trip down the uh, Panama on the Yukon to uh, Marshall, down near the mouth of the Yukon. And it was a pretty leisurely trip. There was plenty of time to stop and visit each of the villages. And of course, the people in the villages were very friendly. And uh, the purser, you know, kind of uh, helped us uh, advise about things and, and of course the meals are something we remember. Uh, fare was, you know, very reasonable. You know, I was fairly young then, but uh, I've always been glad I did it. Well, there was a lot of removals that had to be accomplished before we could even begin restoration. 
In 1965, the entire saloon deck and Texas decks were both gutted, all transverse and longitudinal bulkheads in the dining room and staterooms were removed uh, to create one great large dining room. They gutted the saloon deck and Texas deck, took everything out, built a restaurant and a kitchen and four restrooms, which we then had to come back and remove. Staterooms were gone. Uh, everything was gone. Uh, we had to replace it. first restoration we've done to any of the bulkheads or any of the interiors occurred up in this area. As you can see, we have replaced all of the mahogany uh, ceiling that was installed before originally and then taken out in 1965 and not replaced with anything. So this is uh, the first time this has been covered since 1965. This panel is one that we had to take off. We found it necessary to replace because they couldn't be restored. As you can see, this is beyond restoration because the veneer is uh, worn through. Now this salon observation area is the first area that we, where we began interior restoration. From here, we moved aft into the beginning of the replacement of the stateroom transverse bulkheads. Uh-huh, mixing up a little west system. Good. The glue we're using is really a lot better than just plain glue. Uh, this is a west system epoxy. This plywood, incidentally, is the same type as was used originally on these uh, stateroom bulkheads. This is the procedure that we'll use on each and every one of these staterooms. We got all the staterooms put in. We put in approximately 38 petitions in here during last winter. And uh, we give it a coat of paint that we're going to put up our mahogany down through the main dining room there. It is a mirror finish mahogany. It is very deep because of the number of coats. It will be beautiful. Everything is being authentically recreated. The vessel burned an average of 24 cords of wood a day, a cord an hour, until it was refitted to burn diesel in 1948. My dad signed many contracts back beginning from 1941 to 1946. He started with a 100 cord contract in Mento, cutting wood four foot lengths for this riverboat. And uh, <clears throat> in the final year, he signed a contract for a thousand cord, and it took the whole community of Mento to get that project done by March. You can see we've attached a cable to the angle point in that hogging system, and we're now uh, going to take the tension from this vertical leg of the hogging system that comes down to the paddle wheel and uh, back to this dead man that we've installed here. We have to take all of the weight off of that structure, that uh, wheel support structure, so that we can replace some of the critical timbers which are filled with dry rot. I think that's going to work just fine. You can always bring more attention to this if you need to, Howard. Well, as you can see, we've started uh, taking apart the side deck. I guess the reasons are obvious. Pretty well full of dry rot. The support timbers underneath, however, as I said before, some of them are good and some of them are not, but for the most part, they're good. Uh, that same 
degree of rot follows through on the stern uh, support structure itself. Now here is a here's a cross member, one of the major portions, uh, parts of the stern structure, terribly dry rotted, whereas its companion beam uh, on the stern is uh, in very good condition. One, five, one, five, seven, eight. Okay. Now what we're doing is shooting the shaft of the stern wheel just to make sure that it itself is level before we start replacing beams. We have to have everything exactly level and true from one side to the other. First we leveled the stern, blocked it up, and began the work replacing and repairing beams and the paddle wheel support structure. We had to mill the new timbers on site by hand because we couldn't find a portable mill large enough to cut them. Get it come along in a line between there. And what have yeah. we got, an eighth of an inch? You've got your deck beam influence in there now. So just put a come along on it and bring it together. It'll go. While light, or not carrying cargo, the Nanana could run in as little as a foot and a half of water. Loaded with 300 tons of freight, the boat's draft was still only three and a half feet. I was 14 when I came to work on this boat here, and there was long, long hours. I could, uh, took some, anywhere from 24 to 30 hours of unloading freight. And from there, I went to Nelato, and that was just about an hour and a half to run. And that Nelato is another 18 to 20 hours to work. So you just got uh, just about an hour of sleep if you can sleep. Authentic historic restoration demands that wherever possible, the original fabric of the vessel be restored rather than replaced, even when replacement would be much easier and cheaper. This required major repair of wood that was rotted and damaged. to the winch. These are what are used to put down into the water when the boat goes aground on a sandbar and lift it up and try to turn it out backwards using the paddle wheel. Or 
they uh, were used at times uh, as horizontal spacers to keep the boat away from being too close to the shore. Uh, these things had to be restored. We had just a tremendous amount of excavation and replacement to do on all of these. They were full of dry rot, but here they are, good as new. Maybe without epoxy in them, they're even better. <laughs> the steamer Nanana is 237 feet long and 42 feet wide, making it the largest wooden river vessel in Alaska history. In 1952, we took this boat from uh, St. Mary's all the way to Whitehorse. For, uh, they had to redeck the bottom of the boat. And it was quite a trip going up to, from Dawson to uh, Whitehorse. We knocked down all the telephone lines in Canada because the smokestack was too high. And the Canadian boats can go under it, but the American boat couldn't go under it. We knocked down about a total of 15 telephone lines on the way up. Well, the idea of painting the vessel, leaving the existing 22 coats of chipped, cracked, and broken paint in place, simply wasn't in keeping with the practice of good historic restoration. We were faced with the extremely intimidating prospect of hand scraping every square inch of this vessel inside and out. First, we would scrape with heat guns and putty knives. After most of the paint was removed, the sanding began. After that, we would fill all of the imperfections and splits and damaged areas in the wood. After sanding again, it was ready for paint. It took three summers and literally thousands of man hours to complete this phase of the restoration. Uh, David then applied uh, two coats of primer and two coats of finish. Uh, the paint was put on in very thin coats in order to make it much easier, five years from now, to just scrub it down and repaint the entire vessel. We knew we had a lot of woodworking to do in order to recreate some special furnishings. So we set up a winter shop where we built tables, doors, the bunk rails for staterooms, a new nameplate for one side of the pilot house, and many other special items. Well, this is one of the original um, windows that came out of the pilot house. And we've been real fortunate in that they were all in place and not broken out. They didn't have any broken styles or rails on them. These are the bunk rails over here for the saloon deck. There were, I think, 75 or 80 bunk rails. There were quite a number of them. And then these are the raised panel doors for in the saloon deck. I built these over the winter. And uh, they're made out of clear fur so that they'd stay straight. And on these tabletops, we didn't have anything to go by. The original captain mentioned that they were 40 inches by 40 inches and made out of fur. I have built two and I'm going to do two more. That'll leave us four tables up in the floor deck here. We were able to find, in a local bar, 22 of the original dining room chairs. We took them completely apart, sanded them, refinished them, and then put them back together. But the observation lounge chairs were a different story. We were only able to find them in pictures. So we called John Manthai. We're making 12 chairs. I guess historical accuracy is the biggest thing. We've been dealing only with photographs on this project. They were unable to resurrect any of the original chairs, but we have had interviews with some of the people that worked on the riverboat Nenana before it was taken out of commission. I am quite interested in the whole Nenana project. Uh, it's a wooden boat, and it intrigues me from a technical standpoint. It's one of the few historical projects that we've ever worked on. 
and that's fun. I like to be a part of a structure like that that has such wonderful craftsmanship involved in it.